So my talk today, uh, Daguerre, the legacy of Daguerre, uh, lucky or genius. Um, when I was doing my research uh, for my dissertation, I was interested in going through the historical record to uh, evaluate claims about the daguerreotype process. And by reenacting what was written, I was able to fill in a lot of gaps in the historical record. And so a small portion of that work uh, predates 1839. And so what this talk is about is to share with you some of the discoveries I've made about Daguerre's progress of discovery. So who is Daguerre? Uh, if you are, want to do a little bit of research about Daguerre, like for example the copy editor for this 1934 advertisement, who was Daguerre, you read the history books, and you'll come up with this uh, headline, In 1839, Daguerre's <coughs> carelessness gave the world photography. Historians have not been kind to our friend Daguerre. Uh, Victor Folk, uh, in The Truth Concerning the Invention of Photography, wrote that it is evident that these pretended improvements and discoveries were only vainglorious imaginings of Daguerre. And John Wurge in the uh, 1880s wrote that it appeared that nature herself had grown tired of Daguerre's bungling and resolved to show him the way. And more recently, uh, Larry Schaff uh, wrote that Daguerre had not been trained in the scientific methodology and was incapable of building on his experiences. Uh, my aim here is to correct this uh, historical record, reverse some of these opinions by offering new evidence based on laboratory reenactments. So my approach, the replication approach, I call myself a hands-on historian, uh, someone who is simply uh, uh, researching with textual records, we call a hands-off historian. And Lear Havley uh, wrote that hands-off historians, they often encounter uh, roadblocks, silences, uh, gaps in the record, and they find it uh, somehow impossible to resist the urge to speculate as to the meaning of such texts. And I'll give you an example of uh, what I'm speaking about. Um, Dr. Kelly Wilder, uh, when she was looking at the literature of photography, and she came across this letter by Jean-Baptiste Biot to Talbot. So when the Daguerre process was hinted at in January of 1839, Talbot you know, woke up and said, hey, I've, I've got something here too. And so he wrote uh, his formula and sent it off to Beale to have it published in the uh, Comprendu. And Beale replied to Talbot. You know, he had Talbot's formula and he had Daguerre's formula. And he replied by saying, the difference with Daguerre is the general principle of the process of the preliminary wash. Daguerre prefers hydrochloric ether. So when a hands-off historian reads this, she replied, Kelly, the process described does not render any paper susceptible of photographic action. However, a hands-on historian like myself, like Joel Snyder, we've made these types of processes. We recognize that what preliminary wash means is the first treatment of the paper. The second treatment is with silver nitrate to make the silver chloride, which is the light-sensitive medium. It was common to both, and so admitted from the historical record. In fact, B.O. says the full details are in Comprendu, and when you read it, it's really interesting. This paper, Daguerre developed in 1826, is nine years before Talbot. And the detail is so precise that Daguerre advises dipping the paper in rather than brushing it on, because if you brush on the silver nitrate solutions, you can get uneven tonalities. So Daguerre had even improved the paper process in 1826, but he gave up on it. He stopped it as a dead end because where there's light, you got dark. Right? He's interested in recording the tones of nature correct to nature, and it's slow. It's not 
uh, it doesn't meet the speed requirement of Daguerre's after, so he abandons the paper process. So in 1829, Daguerre and Nieps form a partnership. <coughs> now, I'm, I'm not here to argue who invented photography. It's clear from these articles uh, of the contract that Nieps invented photography. My goal here is to emphasize Daguerre's contribution to the development of the world's first viable, uh, commercially practical photographic process. This was the primary aim of this contract, to bring the method to a practical, marketable process. One of the key articles of the contract is Article 5, where Nietzsche contributes the heliograph process, the invention, which is equal to half of the proceeds of the contract, and Daguerre's contribution is to uh, contribute his new design of camera obscura, meaning lens, and his talents and his industry. Both partners recognize that this was an equal contribution. How has this phrase been uh, interpreted in the, by historians? Gernsheim writes that Daguerre's much vaunted camera turned out to be nothing fundamentally new. And Mark Osterman, uh, he, during a workshop that I, I co-taught with him at Eastman House years ago, I overheard him say that Nieps invented photography. All Daguerre had to offer was a camera. Those comments really dismiss the importance of Daguerre's optical research. When Daguerre saw this plate in 1829 by Nieps, this is one of, one of Nieps's early views taken with a camera, he wrote to Nieps, the meniscus lens you, you use does not completely eliminate spherical aberration, and it's ineffective with refractive aberration. This is 1829. And B.O., sorry, Nieps, sorry, wrote that uh, to Lemaitre, the engraver. He says, in order to achieve a decided success, we need to have a, a lens as perfect as Daguerre's. And we have to increase the photosensitivity of our process. Nieps was quite convinced about Daguerre's lens. Another example, in 1833, when they were working with the physiotype process and the heliograph, the process was quite slow. And so Daguerre drew this illustration of the orientation of an achromatic lens and said, if you place it in the camera this way, in fact, in the same orientation as you use as a telescope, you'll gain a stop at least. The problem with using it in this way is that you suffer from spherical aberration. So fast, but not sharp to the corners. When you turn the lens around, as Daguerre finally used in the camera of 39, it's much sharper to the corners, but you lose a stop. So this is Daguerre advising Nieps on you know, how to work with the optics to perhaps get uh, faster exposures. You know, a stop is significant when the exposure is in a matter of days. So, B.O. was writing to Talbot, again, how Talbot worked with Chevalier to improve the achromatic lens. Not that it's something not fundamentally new, as Gernsheim wrote. Daguerre worked with that lens in how it responded to light with the photographic process. So Daguerre worked the curvatures. He recognized the process was sensitive to the blue-green range could not see orange, orange, yellows, and reds. So why achromatize to that range? So he worked with it to work within the actinic colors of the spectrum and got much sharper images. So this is uh, the, the final lens uh, in the camera that was put to market in 1839. Achromatized to the actinic spectrum, not the full visual spectrum. How did Daguerre do this? Right? You know, he's working with a very fast medium. He's working with phosphorus. In his diorama paintings, he's using phosphorus mixed with colors to glow as 
light is projected either on the back or on the front of these canvases, phosphorus <coughs> reacts to light in seconds. So even though he's working with a medium that's not stable, he can't fix it, he's able to observe the optical effects as he's designing these lenses. So back to the partnership, what are they actually looking for? Well, I propose the first thing is speed. Daguerre writes to Nieps that for success, we need to work within 15 minutes or less. This is an aim. If we, if we can't make the, a successful photograph in 15 minutes, it's not going to be sharp. It's not going to be successful. The, you know, the term, the art of fixing a shadow, has been used in exhibitions and in catalogs. It sounds a very poetic way of describing photography, but it's a very practical way of describing photography. If you sit in a backyard and you watch a shadow, you can actually see a shadow move if you, if you stare at it. As the sun transverses the sky, the shadows will move. So if your exposures are in the hours, those shadows are blurred and you do not have a, a highly resolved image. So this is where Daguerre is saying, we need to have our exposures down to 15 minutes or shorter. That's aim number one. The second aim, quality. You want lights and shades correct to nature. Where there's light, you want white. Not the print, like Talbot was working with. And you want a sharpness, a good, delicate gradation of tones, and the perfection of detail. You know, this is the photographic standard that Daguerre and Nieps have established, which still exists to this day. They've established this standard. This is from Daguerre's description of the process in 1838. And of course, the last aim of all would-be inventor of photography is to make the image permanent. Once the image is made, it must be fixed against further changes in daylight. So the partnership is established. Vincent Chevalier writes, you know, as soon as the contract was written, Daguerre disappears. You know, he was visiting him once a week at the, at the optician shop, and then suddenly he disappears. He ensconces himself into his laboratory, surrounded by chemical treatises and flasks and chemicals, and he's just working, 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 taking up his obligation in the contract to use his talents in industry to advance what Nieps had invented. And so what Daguerre did was he improved the heliograph into a process the partners called the physototype. Now, here's an example on the left is a reproduction of one of Nieps's physototypes. We'll, we'll not know how it originally was because the original was lost. It was, it, it was in the collection of the SFP and it was sent to a conservator in Paris in the early 1900s. And in a fit of madness, the conservator smashed it and everything else in his lab. Uh, however, we, we can thank uh, Jean-Louis Marinier in 2004 actually replicated the physototype process. And you can see an example here. So, this is in the, in the early 1830s, and Nieps is struggling with uh, having the white residue of lavender form uh, very bright on the plate. So you coat the plate and it dries as a white residue. And Nieps was struggling, his, was, his were dull and dingy, and Daguerre's were, were, were good. And so D Daguerre uh, sent a pint of the water from the Seine to Nieps. And he said, let's try this. Maybe it's the water. Why don't you dip a third of the plate in water from the Seine, a third of the plate in water from the Salon, and leave the center dry, and let's observe the effect. This is a month before Nieps dies. Here's Daguerre guiding Nieps in a scientific experiment. So, you know, when Larry Schaaf says, you know, Daguerre was not trained in science, maybe not academically, but he was certainly a hands-on empirical scientist. So, how much of an improvement was the physototype? The Nieps plate of 1827, the work from Marinier, shows us that the exposure was June, June 4th to June 10th. Days long. 
Yes, it's, he's invented photography, but it is certainly not within that 15-minute goal. Daguerre, the phototype process in camera required eight hours. It's a significant improvement, but still not within the 15-minute uh, the goal. So do we know what a phototype, is there any extent phototypes? I'm going to uh, discuss this plate for a minute. This plate is an enigma in the history of photography. It's, uh, it's in, in England. Right now it's at the Victoria and Albert Museum. Uh, it is with alongside a contact um, heliograph of Cardinal Ambrose and another one of Christ carrying the cross. And then this image. It's attributed to Niepce. It's a coincidence. So if this is made in 1827, this image, by the way, is one of Daguerre's artworks. So how is it that Niepce would have made this before collaborating with Daguerre using one of Daguerre's arts, before the partnership? This plate is also not mentioned among the list of materials that were with Francis Bauer at Kew Garden. Uh, as the, you know, what Francis Bauer had was the view that's at the Harry Ransom Center, the one I showed earlier with the three dimples, and two contact prints from uh, lithographs. Uh, the first time this plate is mentioned is 1844 in Robert Hunt. It's called Ruins of an Abbey. Written on the back of this plate in Francis Bauer's hand is from a print two and a half feet long which, replies, which uh, implies a reduction in scale. And, but this is a contact print, as we'll soon see. So look at the quality difference. This is view, and the EPS is view from a window. The image tones are very, very uh, severe. It's very contrasty. Compare that to the tones in the in Claire de Lune. Same year, 1827. This print is visually far more beautiful than the uh, than the view uh, out of Niepce's window. Daguerre wrote in the heliograph. He, he critiqued this heliograph. He said, the whitest whites are not white. So that was one of the things Daguerre tried to improve with the heliograph, was make the highlights brighter. Okay. So what, account, what accounts for the improved highlights? It's the sphericals of the residue of lavender rather than bitumen of Judea. So Daguerre wrote uh, about the phototype. He says, I've replaced the bitumen uh, with the residue of the essential oil of lavender, and it's dissolved in alcohol, and you spread it on a plate. And it's not a homogeneous coating, but little dots, uh, small sphericals of resin over the entire surface. Now, he's describing this to Arago in 1839 uh, in a letter about engraving images for photographic reproduction. But that description is exactly like the photo micrograph taken of this plate uh, about 10 years ago. And Dushan Stulak uh, analyzed the material, and it is indeed the resin of uh, lavender oil. But that's the phototype process. That's not 1827. So if you look at the back of the two images we're talking about, how did this plate come to be attributed to Niepce for 1827? On the front, it's got the uh, descriptions, but that was, those descriptions were put on in 1885 by Henry Peach Robinson when they were exhibited uh, uh, then. On the back, there's a label on the view from Niepce's window, it's written directly on the paper backing. But on Un Claire de Lune, that same inscription is copied almost verbatim, but only on a separate label. And Niepce's name is spelt wrong. So I would say that that attribution was put on sometime later. The only thing that's dated in Francis Bauer's hand is from a print two and a half feet long. So how is it that Francis Bauer has this in his possession? It wasn't in his possession uh, when he wrote in um, the uh, Literary Gazette. 
he wrote this. The specimens Mr. Epps brought and exhibited in 1827 in England are in my position are quite as perfect as those productions of Mr. Daguerre described in the newspapers. So this is Bauer saying, you know, never having seen a daguerreotype, he's he's trying to be Niepce's champion here. He's saying, here's this Frenchman Daguerre who's published that he's discovered photography, but I've got these things that are 10 years old, and they're just as perfect as daguerreotypes, okay? having never seen one. I propose that, you know, when Daguerre read this, now he knew Bauer. He wrote to Bauer on Niepce's behalf in 1830. When Daguerre wrote this, I, I think Daguerre felt obliged to stand up for himself and say, wait a minute, I improved this process significantly. And here's an example of the work. And he, my, my theory is that Daguerre sent the physiotype after this publication with a note that said, you know, by the way, this is from a, one of my artworks that's two and a half feet long. So not only has he improved the process for tonal quality is also showing a way of doing photomechanical reproduction. How to make a reduction from a painting and create a secondary copy. So Daguerre used this motif several times. I mean, you can see different examples of, of these, uh, these details and the like in the paintings for his diorama. So how do we explain this enigma? I, I, I propose that Daguerre photographed this painting of his, or drawing of his, it's two and a half feet long, to make a physiotype on pewter, on glass, whatever it is. He then sends you know, that physiotype to George Mile, the engraver, who makes an engraving from the physiotype, from the reduced camera copy. Daguerre wrote that, yes, you can etch a physiotype with acid for engraving because of that structure, but it, it still needed handwork. It wasn't, the engraving alone wasn't enough. You had to further enhance the shadows. And you can see evidence of handwork in this engraving. So George Mile makes the engraving. One of the engravings gets back to Daguerre, who varnishes it to make it more translucent to make a contact print for in Claire de Lune. So this is, you know, my point here is that, you know, Niepce has been given credit, and yes, indeed, he invented photography. Exposure time was five days. Daguerre advances the process, but now it's eight hours. It is still not practical. It's still not within that 15-minute aim. It's not useful. You can't make money at this. So Daguerre turns to iodized silver plates. So the story of Daguerre's discovery of the light sensitivity of silver iodide is also sort of unkind to Daguerre. They said, you know, he, he discovered the effect by accidentally leaving a spoon on an iodized plate and coming back later and pulling the spoon away and, mon dieu, there's a shadow of the spoon on the iodized plate. Uh, that was published first in 1844 by Gaudin. When Daguerre read about it, he dismisses it as, as a fable. He said to Mechen, the mayor of, of Brice le Marne, ah, that's, that's not true. Daguerre, if he's reading these tr uh, treatises, he's surrounded with chemical books. Humphrey Davy wrote about the light sensitivity of silver iodide in 1811. So that is, the light sensitivity of iodide is, is known. But where I have to give Daguerre credit, now, again, Niepce used iodine to blacken the heliographs. You know, on a silver plate, after the image is made, he would blacken the shadows by exposing it to iodine and letting it darken. Now, Niepce was under the impression that this was creating an oxide of silver. Right. Um, however, you have to give Daguerre credit for recognizing how rapid the reaction is of silver iodide on a silver plate. Silver iodide on its own is not that fast, not that, but when you have it in com combined with silver metal, you can get the, the effect of a shadow in five minutes. So here's my reenactment of leaving a spoon on a plate, 
And in five minutes, you can see the shadow, and it's very well de um, defined in 10 minutes. Now we've met the first condition. You're creating an effect on a plate within 15 minutes. And Daguerre writes to Niepce in 1831, Iodine is exceedingly sensitive. I've re retained results in a camera in three minutes, in a solar microscope in two minutes, and by contact print, one minute. This is excellent, but we must find a way to reverse the tones. Where there's light, you want white. What you're getting here is the reverse. You're getting a, you're getting a printed out negative in camera, essentially. So here's uh, an example of what that might look like. Uh, this was taken in the dullest day in November in a mere 20 minutes, uh, a printed out image in camera. So the first goal has been, been achieved. We have to make, uh, meet the second goal is tones correct with nature. So at this point, uh, Niepce has passed away. His uh, son has inherited the contract. In 1835, the contract is rewritten, uh, May 1st. And from the two articles that are changed, you get a clue as to what's really going on here. So the first article is that the heliograph, the Epps invention, uh, has have undergone great improvements through the work of Daguerre. It's reached a point where no further improvements are possible. They've come to a dead end. It's eight hours in a camera. So. The process then becomes replaced with something uh, that Daguerre has discovered, that silver iodide on a silver plate is exceedingly sensitive, which will replace the basis for the original heliograph. So working with silver iodide. The goal now is to convert the tones where there's black in the camera, you know, the image is formed in camera, it's a negative, now to reverse those tones by some chemical means. So this is the goal here. Um, at this point, um, they're saying success, taking success for granted. They haven't yet achieved that. Right? It's close, but they haven't quite yet achieved that. So it's achieved by this story that we all know in the history of photography, the magic cupboard. All right? So the story goes that fortunate accident led Gare to discover mercury vapor. So he's got these plates, he's sensitizing them with iodine, and he's, and he's exposing them, and oh, the sun went away. There's no image on the plate, the, the latent image. He puts it in the cupboard and come back, comes back the next day, and mon dieu, there's an image on the plate. Right? So that's the story uh, of accidental discovery. Um, you know, this, this method of developing with mercury vapor is so extraordinary in terms of photochemistry that some people thought it impossible to have come up with this by inductive reasoning. It must have been an accident. <clears throat> so my goal here is to kind of give you an idea that it's possible that he could have worked through a number of chemicals to come up with mercury vapor, not by a magic cupboard, <clears throat> but rather uh, through a step-by-step -step process. <clears throat> So the magic cupboard story, you know, there's two different variations, there's more than two, but you know, Justice Liebig in 1865 wrote that Daguerre left the plate in a cupboard containing a basin of mercury for weeks. And at Gernsheim, oh no, it was just a few drops from a broken thermometer overnight. You know, the, the reactants are wildly different here, the amount of mercury vapor. <clears throat> So um, in 1831, in the period between 1831 and 1835, that magic cupboard experiment or story, in, uh, it suggests that there's a latent image on a plate and that it's revealed by mercury vapor. But Daguerre writes that he didn't know the image existed on the surface of the plate before it was visible. That's an important clue. What Daguerre is telling us is that I'm making images in camera so they're visible as negatives. And then I am doing whatever I can to reverse those tones. We must find a way, he writes to Niepce, to reverse the effect. So the first thing that Niepce, uh, sorry, Daguerre tries 
is carbon dioxide, carbonic acid, to reverse the effect. Now, how do you come up with that? <clears throat> well, uh, I suggest that, you know, let's look at what was known in, in analytical chemistry in 1831. So Justice Liebig, 1831, invents the Kali apparat. So the Kali apparat is a device for chemical analysis. So if you want to know the amount of uh, material in a substance, you decompose it, burn it by fire. The byproduct of fire combustion is carbon dioxide. Right? And if you can capture the carbon dioxide in a device and weigh it, you can work out the proportions of the elements involved. And so the Kali apparat was a device to ensure in the combustion chain that you actually captured all of the carbon dioxide. If it's some escape, then your experiment's a failure. So at the end of the Kali apparat device, he put copper oxide, which is black. And when you expose copper oxide to carbon dioxide, it lightens. It turns to a salmon color. So at the time, the Epps thought that the, that the printed out image was an oxide of silver. So it, it seems logical to say, well, if ca uh, carbon dioxide will lighten copper oxide, maybe it'll lighten silver oxide. So that was the first uh, chemical he tried, limited success. Uh, the next thing he tries is potassium cl uh, chloride. Chlorate of potassium. I'm not sure of exactly what it is, but it is a, some, a chlorine compound with potassium. Now he's trying to heat this in a vessel, like a mercury bath, like a chamber, to have the white flowery stuff deposit on the image. Very limited success. The next white uh, thing he tries is mercuric uh, chloride. Uh, so he writes, I got there step by step. I tried corrosive sublimate, that's mercuric chloride. <clears throat> it marked the images a little, but the results were grainy and coarse. Then he tried sweet mercury or calomel. Well, calomel has twice the mercury in it that mercuric chloride has. So if, uh, you know, and then it was better and hope has returned to him. So, <clears throat> It was just a short step to get to mercury. So, you know, by the way, th this where we get this information from is when Daguerre was given the pension for uh, giving the details of the Daguerreotype process to the French nation, he then was uh, charged with giving public demonstrations, uh, September 7th, uh, and then September 14th, and then a week after that. And so after the first public demonstration, they all gather back at the, uh, at the house, uh, gathering of dignitaries at uh, the Minister of the Interior's place. And they were asking him, you know, you must have been elated when you discovered mercury vapor, when you discovered this. And Daguerre replied, you know, sadly, alas, no, really, after 14 years of experiment and disappointment, it had robbed him of any sense of joy. He wasn't really able to, to grasp the significance of his discovery. And then uh, he says it's only a short step to the vapors of metallic mercury. So in the translation, I'm sorry about the overlapping text because I kind of missed that in a, in a whatever. But, you know, Daguerre says, mon bon genie. You know, and when, when Gernsheim translates that, that phrase, he says, good fortune or good luck, which reinforces the magic cupboard story, where you can also read Mon Bon Genie as sort of a tacit understanding, a genius from, based on experiment and research, that, you know, calomel has twice the mercury in it than mercury chloride, mercury may be the agent, and then it was just a short step to mercury vapor. So, by the way, you know, Daguerre said it's 14 years of work. It's, you know, when Gernsheim was translating that sentence, he changes it into English as 11 years. I don't know how you can confuse Couture's with 11. 
unless your intention is to show that Daguerre's work didn't start until after that view of the window in 1827. Nevertheless, Daguerre is using now mercury vapor <clears throat> to bring out, to reverse the printed out tones. So just give an example of the balance of reactants here. If I take a drop of mercury solid, uh, and solid silver, you know, liquid mercury, you get, and drop it on a plate, it will amalgamate over a period of time, and you'll get the whitest, brightest crystal of, of white. You know, if there's a broken thermometer involved in this whole story, maybe it, you did break a thermometer and it got onto a silver plate, you know, and maybe that's the, the part of, the, of, the, of that story. But Daguerre wrote in his treatise that Niepce was not acquainted with a property possessed by iodine that is decomposed by light. Daguerre understood at some point in this study that what happens to silver iodine upon exposure is it's broken back into its base elements, so silver and iodine. And so he realizes that the image in the camera printed out is silver metal. And it can be changed to white with mercury. And so he's actually, uh, when he was describing his progress of discovery to uh, Mead, when Mead went to visit the Guerin in 1848, he said he tried boiling mercury. Well, anybody that's made a daguerreotype knows you cannot use boiling mercury. It, the, the, the balance of reactants is far too high. You know, you, that's, boiling mercury tells me that daguerre was still trying to convert a visible image to white. And here's an example on the right where I actually made a printed out image and then with, I didn't use boiling mercury, but I used a lot of mercury and I was able to convert uh, the image, uh, reverse the tones. So, what I propose happened is that Daguerre is using a mercury bath. You can observe it through the red glass window of his design. And so, he's reducing the exposure and the mercury. He's re reducing both reactants down to the point of latency. So, he now realizes the latent image, less temperature, you're still getting images. So, at this point, it's actually published that Daguerre has discovered a means of fixing an image in a camera obscura. You know, this should be one of the most important lines in the history of photography. This is Journal des Artistes, September 1835. It's said that Mr. Daguerre has discovered a means of receiving on a plate of his own preparation images produced by the camera obscura, so that a portrait, a landscape, a view of any kind, is presented and permanent. The physical sciences have never presented such a comparable wonder as this. It's been dismissed by historians. Gernsheim, you know, he says, you know, uh, he'd only informed Niepce of it. He couldn't show him anything because the images were unfixed. Now, Gernsheim's applying 20th century chemical photographic knowledge. Uh, Fizeau says, you know, if, this, if, it, if he had discovered something in 1835, how come we don't know about it, right? Why is it, you know, that it took two more years before the first extant image of 1837? He, he writes that, you know, the problem of fixation would not have impeded a scientist like Talbot. So he's saying that Daguerre, you know, was struggling. It took him two years to figure out how to fix the image. <clears throat> Daguerre wrote to Niepce, Jr., uh, in October, that he found several ways to fix the image. One of the ways, he says, I let the sun in my laboratory without any precaution to preserve, preserve them. When I read that, I immediately understood what it meant, because I'd been working with printed out images on the camera. So I propose what Daguerre would have done to achieve this is you iodize a plate. You don't even have to polish it. Just make it clean. Iodize a plate. Latent image exposure. Two minutes. That's all you need. 
1835 in the summer, two minutes. Talbot took four hours to make his negative in the camera, but two minutes. Develop with mercury vapor, that gives you your whites. You let the sun in your laboratory, and the light energy will decompose the silver iodide remaining in the shadows to deposit very fine particulate black silver. And so here's that plate after five hours is changing from the yellow silver iodide to black shadow particles. The next day, now this is unfixed by any by the descriptions that we understand with fixing agents. And then after 50 days, it still looks the same. It still looks the same today, four years later. This has met the third challenge: a permanent photographic image. This is permanent by any sense of photography we know today. Images correct to nature. White where there's light, black where there's blacks. <clears throat> he may have indeed achieved what was printed and announced in the Journal des Artistes, that he's discovered a permanent photographic record. Why don't we know about this? Well, I propose the reason being is quality. Daguerre wants lights and shades correct the nature with a sharpness of image in the delicate gradation of tones and perfection of detail. It's a nice image. It's certainly better than the camera negative that Talbot made out of the Oreo window. It's sharp, well-defined, but it doesn't meet Daguerre's standard of perfection. <laughs> Daguerre spends from 35 to 37 trying to improve the contrast of these images, and the way he tries it is by etching the shadows with acid so they'll take a bite of dusting on lamp black. So he's trying to improve the contrast by applying black. And he realizes after several failures that the delicate highlight image particles, as fragile as dust on a butterfly's wing, can't withstand that kind of treatment. So after a couple of years, he finally abandons the application of contrast-enhancing pigments and realizes the best blacks come from just having a polished plate that will reflect black. And so now he has to find a way of removing the silver iodide. Not just let it print out, not etch it with acid. He has to find a way of removing that. And in 1837, he comes up with salt water fixation. The earliest extant image, now this one unfortunately has been treated by a conservator who wiped it out. Um, but this luckily is a photographic record of it. This is 1837, it's the early extant uh, uh, image made by Daguerre. It's much better in quality, we assume than the 1835 work. And so he put the plate in salt water. So <clears throat> think about this for a minute. Daguerre discovers that by putting it in salt water, the silver iodide is dissolved. He knows that iodine comes from seaweed, seawater. Right? So if you can if you can distill iodine from the ocean, Maybe if we put it back in the ocean, it'll dissolve it. Right? So he puts it in salt water. Now, Talbot did the same, but his images are permanent. He's basically stabilized them because the balance of uh, silver and salt are, are, are reversed. This method of immersing a plate in salt water does indeed fix a daguerreotype plate if it's on a copper substrate. This may have been the only lucky thing that happened in Daguerre's progress of discovery. Because the plate is copper-backed and silver front, it's bimetal. And you put it into an electrolyte of salt water, and it electrolytically decomposes the silver iodide. So this experiment, the plate on the right is done on a clad silver plate. The plate on, sorry, on the left, it's a clad silver plate. The plate on the right is the same thing tried with a solid silver plate. It won't fix in salt water. After 10 minutes, it will not fix in salt water. So by electrolytically removing the silver iodide, he's now found a way to remove the iodine 
And essentially, the process is as announced in 39, except for advances in plate material. So in 38, he goes to a plate maker asking for an improved surface. Can you beat the plates with a planishing hammer? Because he's now realizing that the best blacks are given from a perfect polish. <clears throat> so just to recap, you know, a foreign correspondent wrote that the uh, images that Daguerre made four years ago, so this is 39, so this correspondent has seen work from 1835. He said they suffered from a haziness, and this defect is now entirely overcome. So on the right, I show you probably the most well-preserved image by Daguerre. This image is at the Academy of Arts in St. Petersburg. It's part of a triptych. It has brilliant whites, good contrast. It's an absolutely astonishing daguerreotype from 1839. There's very few daguerre examples around to see. This is one of the finest. And it gives you an idea of how much quality Daguerre was after, why he didn't announce in 35, why he didn't announce uh, until four years later. And it's partly explained by Arago, who says, over the last five years, Mr. Daguerre's method has merely undergone minor improvements that only a distinguished artist would consider necessary. So this is, this is the, 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 the process as it was introduced in 1839. Well, part of the contract with Daguerre and the French government was that Daguerre was also to provide any further advancements that he may come up with. And so Daguerre did work, continue to work. Some people say Daguerre rested, got the money and sat back and retired, rested on his laurels. No, Daguerre continued to work with the process. And this is the last extant plate. This is 1844. This is by Daguerre from the view of his uh, house in brie sur marne of the town of Brie. And this is at the collection in the SFP in Paris. Here I am looking at it. It's got this bizarre circular, you know, defect, if you will, on the surface. And people have been trying to explain this. Uh, some conservators says, well, maybe it was a bad attempt at conservation, right? Um, <clears throat> when I started to read uh, Daguerre's research in 44, you know, photog history of photography is easier, cheaper, faster, right? And so one of the uh, improvements to the original process was the second halogen. So chlorine was introduced by Antoine Claudet, 1840. That increases the speed by a factor of 10. 10 minutes now becomes one minute. Bromine was also attempted. But in the bromine is increases when done well, increases by a factor of 60. Literally turns minutes to seconds. But it's impossible to manage. You had to get it exactly right or you get foggy, veiled, horrible images. It took some time before Daguerreans worked out the best way to deal with bromine. And so Daguerre was working on the problem. And <clears throat> he wrote that by adding gold to the surface of the plate before sensitizing, the gold deposits and the platinum deposits minimize the effect of the bromine veil. It restrained the fogging. And as an experiment, I thought, well, how do you tell, how do you test cause and effect? The best way is to isolate the variables on a single plate. So how do you add gold to a portion of a plate? Right? So I surmised that Daguerre placed a round ring of some sort onto the surface of the plate and poured in a solution to precipitate gold and platinum on the plate. And so I tried to, re to replicate that. I put a ring on my plate and I poured in gold chloride solution and I noticed a little bit of liquid seeped out to create a half moon shaped puddle in the circle. It is exactly the same thing happened in the view of Brie sur Marne. And so this plate was made by iodine and then bromine and shoot. And where I didn't deposit gold, it's foggy, and where 
the gold is there in the plate. It's a clearer image. So my, you know, I, I show this to, to show, so that Daguerre continued to work with the process even as late as 1844. Because he's trying to solve the challenge of dealing with bromine, which does accelerate the process magnificently, but it is extremely difficult to deal with. Now, why don't we know about this? Well, around the same year, um, the, the second iodizing application was introduced. So the process now, as we practice it, is you give the plate iodine, you expose it to bromine, and then under safe light conditions, give it that second coating of iodine. And that will, that is the best way to manage the bromine. Chlorine doesn't have this problem. You, you know, so chlorine was very popular for the first two or three years of portrait photography. But it was significantly six times slower than bromine. So anyway, that's um, about all I have to say about Daguerre. So I thank you for your attention. Stop the recording. Now, certainly take some questions.